Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. This is section 9.4. We're going to talk about the ellipse and the hyperbola. The first one we're going to look at is the ellipse. The ellipse is this oval shape. And what defines an ellipse are two points called focus. Each one is a focus. More than one would be a foci. So we have these two foci. Any point on this shape has the sum of the distances is a constant from these foci. So whether it's a point here, the sum of these distances will be the same as a point here and the sum of its distances. So the sum of their distances is always a constant. Now, for this example, our ellipse is centered at the origin. Now, when we have an ellipse centered at the origin, its standard form looks like this, where we have x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal to 1. When it comes to an ellipse or a hyperbola, one thing we want to keep in mind is we always want to set it equal to 1. Now, when we have an ellipse centered at the origin, the x-intercept is actually defined by the values of a. Now, if we look at the graph, we can see there's an x-intercept here and an x-intercept here. Well, we have to find the values of a from a squared. When we introduce a square root, we have to remember plus or minus. So if we look at this, a equals plus or minus the square root of a squared, because either value will give me the value I'm looking for. So our intercepts, because it's centered at the origin, this is a value away, and this is a value away. So our intercepts are a0, that's the intercept to the right, and negative a0, the intercept to the left. So we can determine the intercepts when it's centered at the origin from a for our x-intercepts. We can do the same thing for b. Well, b is going to be plus or minus the square root of b squared. So when we do that, well, our y-intercept, x is always 0. We would have b. This would be the intercept above the axis, positive. And we'd have 0, negative b, the intercept below the axis. So we'd have this value and this value, respectively. And if we had four values such as that, we could then connect them in a nice curved value to give us the shape of our ellipse on a graph. Let's look at an example of an ellipse here. Here we have x squared over 9 plus y squared equals 1. Now, the equation is set equal to 1. And that's the first thing I always want to do is get it equal to 1. I can see that I have an a, val a squared value here. So I'm going to determine a right now as plus or minus what value would give me 9? 3. So I can plot at least those two points as x-intercepts, positive 3 and negative 3. Then what about my b value? Well, I don't see a b, b value, but I can always think of any value over 1. I'm not changing it. So what value would give me 1 if I squared it? Well, my b value, the square root of 1, plus or minus 1. So I would go up 1 for that y-intercept and down 1 for that y-intercept. And we can see we have our four shapes. This one is centered at the origin. So we can then connect these to form the ellipse that is defined by that equation. Hopefully, that's not too bad. We're going to use these tools, a and b, to find the edges of our ellipse. Let's look at this one here. Well, the first thing I recognize is this is not set equal to 1. And I know it's not a circle. How I can determine the difference between an ellipse and a circle is the coefficients are not the same. In a circle, they're always the same value. So the first thing I want to do is set this equal to 1. So I'm going to divide everything by 16 and simplify if necessary. Well, 16 over 16 is 1. 4 over 16 would leave me a 4 in the denominator. x over 16, or x squared over 16, doesn't reduce. So now we have the equation in a standard form. This is centered at the origin. So from here, I can determine the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. My x-intercepts are going to be plus or minus the square root of 16, which is plus 4 and minus 4. 
And for my b value, the y-intercepts, it's going to be plus or minus 2. So up 2 and down 2. And now I can connect these values to make my ellipse. Obviously, I can draw an ellipse better than I can a circle if you watched the last video. All right, now here we have an ellipse that is not centered at the origin. If we notice here, and if we recall how we worked with circles, the values in the parentheses before we squared it for a circle was the HK center of the circle. That still holds true for an ellipse. So we don't have to learn any new techniques. We can determine the center of the ellipse essentially by looking at the h and k value. Now, I recall it's always the opposite of what I see in those parentheses. So my h value is positive 3, and my k value is negative 3. So from the point, 3, negative 3 is the center of my ellipse. So I'm going to go over 3 in the right and then down 3 to find my value of the center of this ellipse. And I'm going to label this 3, negative 3. Now, from here, I can use the a and b values to determine those points. They're no longer intercepts because it's not centered at the origin. So I'm going to determine what the a value is. Well, what value squared would give me 9, plus or minus 3? Well, because this is an x value, it deals with the horizontal values, the x values left or right. So from the center, I can go 3 to the right and 3 to the left. So I'm going to go 3 to the left and 3 to the right to find those values. I can do the same thing with the b value. The only difference now, because it's not centered at the origin, is that this b value is the distance from the center of the ellipse. So if I take the square root of 16, I find the b value to be plus or minus 4. So I would go up 4, and I would go down 4, and now I'm ready to draw this ellipse. And hopefully we can see that that is an elliptical shape centered at 3, negative 3, with an a value of plus or minus 3 and a b value of plus or minus 4. Four. So let's look at the standard form of an ellipse not centered at the origin. Its center is hk, just as it was in the circle. But a and b are the distances from that center, where a cannot equal b. And the reason why we say that is because if a and b are the same values, this would actually be a circle. Its coefficients would be the same, so it's not elongated in one direction or the other. But if these values are different, then we have an ellipse. How do we find the a value? We take plus or minus the square root of a squared, which is going to give me plus or minus values for a, two different values for a. To find b, we do plus or minus b squared. That gives me two different values for the b, the distances from the center to the edges of my ellipse in the y direction. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on and look at a hyperbola. Now a hyperbola is sometimes a little bit more uh, complex, especially when it comes to graphing. A hyperbola, if you recall in 9.2 when we defined conic sections, we talked about a hyperbola being the mirror image of two parabolas. That's why we call it hyperbola. Two, you know, more, more bolas, essentially, is what that comes down to. If we look at this, the standard form of a hyperbola that opens left or right is x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. And a hyperbola, like an ellipse, has foci. It has two foci, one for this half and one for that half. The distance between these foci, the absolute value of their differences, the difference between these distances, and notice we have a difference. This is what makes it different than an ellipse. The differences between these distances is a constant. So even if I had a value over here, we'll call this d2. The absolute value of the difference of these 
will be the same as the absolute value of the difference of these. So we're looking at differences. And the reason why we say absolute value is because everything's squared. It would be a positive. So that is the definition of a parabola, but, or excuse me, a hyperbola. It is the difference between the squared terms. Now, what we have to recognize is there's two versions, the one that opens left or right and the one that opens up or down. Now, how are these equations different? Well, the positive term actually tells us what direction it opens. If I see the x squared first and the difference between squared terms, I know that, first of all, that difference tells me that it's a hyperbola. And the leading term tells me the direction that it opens. Well, x is left and right. So this one would open left or right. If I look at this one, I see the y term is first. It's a hyperbola because it's the difference of squared terms. And the y term is first, so it opens in the direction of y. Up and down is the direction that y goes. So let's go ahead and graph one. And we'll see that we have to implore some tools that we're, we haven't used before. So to graph a hyperbola, we're going to treat it like we did an ellipse. We have x squared over 9 minus y squared equals 1. And I can always think of any value being over 1. So the first thing I'm going to do is determine a and b. Well, a would be plus or minus 3, the value squared that give me 9. And b would be plus or minus 1. Now, what I'm going to do with those values is different than an ellipse. I'm not going to go just up 1 and down 1 or right 3 and left 3. What I'm going to do is I have to use both at the same time. So my a value is plus or minus 3. So I'm going to go over 3, but I'm going to go up 1 and down 1. What I'm going to do is essentially plot all the different combination of points a and b. So I could have 3, 1. I could have negative 3, negative 1, or negative 3, positive 1. There's four different combinations. So if I go left 3 or negative 3, I go up 1, and I go down 1. And what we get here is a rectangle. So I'm going to sketch a rectangle, and I use this dotted line. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw diagonals. So hopefully, we see the diagonals here. Now, now that I've done that extra work here, I am ready to graph this hyperbola. And I can do that by saying, well, what direction does it open? Does it open left or right? Or does it open up or down? Well, the x term is first, so I know it opens in the direction of x. It's going to open left and right. So what I can do now that I have my diagonals through the corner of that rectangle is start at the edge of that box and draw towards those, rectangle, or those diagonals. And notice it looks like a parabola, except it's opening to the left. I'm going to do the same thing on this side, start at the edge of that box and draw lines towards my diagonals. And this would be the parabola to the right. So hopefully that makes sense that we have these points, which would be negative a, b. This point, negative a, negative b. This point here, a, b. And this point, a, negative b. The four combinations of those values determine the edges of this box. Now, I just want to uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more on ellipses and hyperbolas. If you think about it in these terms, and this is just an analogy, we have two squared terms. We had that with an ellipse. And we had that with a hyperbola. When we started working with functions and graphs, we saw parabolas were a squared term. Maybe y equals x squared. And we've got that parabola, that u shape. Well, now we have two squared shapes. So let's think of two parabolas just for a moment. If I have an ellipse, I'm adding two squared terms together. If I add two squared terms together, I put them together, and it makes an ellipse. Two squared terms being added is an ellipse. With a hyperbola, 
I'm subtracting the squared terms, this squared term minus that squared term. And if I subtract them, that means they open away from each other. They're going in different directions because we're finding a difference. And we get that shape of a hyperbola. So hopefully, when you're trying to recognize these equations, that'll help you do so. Let's look at another example of a hyperbola, because we only get better with practice. If we look at this one, in standard form, it has to be set equal to 1. Well, I see I have the difference between squared terms, so I've identified it as a hyperbola. So the first thing I want to do is set it equal to 1. Divide all the terms by 36 and simplify. So if I reduce this, it becomes y squared over 9 minus x squared over 36. 36 divided by 36 is 1. Now it's in standard form. So I'm going to determine my a and b's. While the b term is under the y, that's going to be plus or minus 3, because that's the value that would give me that. The x term, or excuse me, the a term is going to be plus or minus 6. The square root of 36 could be plus or minus 6. Now that I have those values, I'm going to plot the four points to make my rectangle. So my b is up 3 or down 3, and my a is 6. So I'm going to go over 6 in the x. So up 3 over 6. I can go up 3 and left 6. I can go down 3 and to the right 6, down 3 and to the left 6. And now I'm just going to draw my rectangle. And now I'm going to draw diagonals through the corners of my box. And now I'm ready to graph this. So the first thing I want to do is determine what direction does it open again. The y term is first, so it opens up or down in the y direction. So I start on the edge of my box, and I draw a curve towards my diagonals. And I do that for the top. I also do it for the bottom. So we can see how drawing a hyperbola can be a little bit more complex, but it's not too difficult. We can still use those a and b values to do that. And when you move on in uh, algebra and in maybe college algebra, you'll learn about these uh, asymptotes or vertical oblique asymptotes, something you'll get to in the future. So let's do a little summary of conic sections. We've seen parabolas in sections 9.1 and 9.2. We've also seen them in chapter 7. They can be in standard form y equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, where h and k is the vertex. And a tells us whether it opens up or down or if it's narrower or wider. And in 9.2, we saw that, well, sometimes we have parabolas that are not functions, but they could open left or right in the direction of x. But they had the same behavior. They're only inverse parabolas. We switched x's with y's. We switched h's with k's. When it comes to a circle, we only had one standard form, which was x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared. And if we recall, it's just like Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Change in x squared, change in y squared equals the distance squared. An ellipse is much like a circle. We have these terms squared, but they have different coefficients. If we can determine what, uh, if we set it equal to 1, we can determine four points, the edges of our ellipse from the center hk. And then a hyperbola we saw was the difference of squared terms. And for the aspects of intermediate algebra, all your hyperbolas will be centered at the origin to uh, not add that additional graphing uh, hurdle. So hopefully you understand parabolas, circle, ellipses, and hyperbolas, sections 9.1 through 9.4. This has been section 9.4. Thank you for watching.